A lot going on here. FTX is now scrambling to find another bailout option now that that Binance deal is officially off. I uh, spoke to sources overnight close to that due diligence process. One person told me that FTX has at least an $8 billion hole on its balance sheet. That is as far as they say they got in the vetting process. Another source telling me the losses could be significantly larger than that. A source who saw those numbers says there were various red flags in there that the quant trading firm Alameda Research that was also founded by Bankman Freed was essentially funding FTX. Separately, Scott, two sources telling me now that the DOJ is investigating FTX and its CEO. The two issues at hand here, the company potentially misappropriating customer funds and misleading investors about that relationship with Alameda and FTX. Bankman Freed, though, you mentioned it, tweeting today about some other deal options. He said this morning there are a number of players who are in talks, they're in talks with LOIs, letter of intent there, term sheets, etc. He says they're also winding down Alameda Research and says, as he put it, I effed up. We asked him about that relationship between those two companies in August. Here's what he said. What about the relationship between FTX and Alameda? I think there's some questions on kind of yep. where those lines are. Yep. Are there any potential conflicts of interest in running as many companies as you do in the same space? Yeah, I've put a lot of work over the last few years into uh, trying to eliminate conflicts of interest there. And, you know, one big piece of this is just like, I don't run Alameda anymore. I don't work for it. Um, none of FTX does, you know, separate staffs. And the way that we view FTX is as a neutral piece of market infrastructure. The latest from the Wall Street Journal, Scott, meanwhile, is that FTX used customer funds to fund some of its riskier bets. They're citing a person familiar with the matter. Bank Fried also reportedly told investors that Alameda owes FTX about $10 billion. A lot going on here, but we'll bring you all the latest. Yep, Scott, and, uh, back to you. I'm sure there'll be more latest later on. Uh, we'll see it. Uh, Kate Rooney, thank you very much. Up next, Mike Santoli is with his midday word when we come back. All right, we're back on the half. Senior Markets commentator Mike Santoli. There he is from the New York Stock Exchange with his midday word. And it's, I guess, relief. 
Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, relief, uh, tension release. Uh, it does show you, and you know, I don't know that it was necessarily all that obvious in the days leading up to today's CPI number that uh, the street was so clenched up expecting the potential for another uh, hot number. Mm -hmm. Clearly, yesterday's events where you did have that extra pressure uh, due to the crypto uh, turmoil on the NASDAQ, on those areas, has set the scene here, right? So the, the S&P is up about twice as much as it was down yesterday. It's a very big one-day move. You and I were talking about the J.P. Morgan note, right, where they did handicap. You could get something like this on a downside surprise in CPI. So it does make sense. And what I find interesting is it's one of these situations where the market's rushing up right to its next potential test. Uh, we're at the S&P above 3,900. We were here, you know, early part of this month, uh, and that's also right in the uh, in the zone where it's kind of uh, middle of middle of the seven month range. Is it going to have enough to go beyond this point, capture some of that seasonal strength that everyone's been talking about for weeks? Yeah, um, sustainable or not, right? I'm trying to think of what is in the the near term here, right? Earnings are, for all intents and purposes, over. You got the Fed meeting in, in December, not for, uh, not for a while, and the next yeah. CPI read itself is the day before that. So is that a pocket of opportunity, if you want to call it that, for this rally to continue? It, it could be. Now, I, we'll get things like retail earnings next week and, and, and things like that. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of Fed speak, too. So you want to see whether there's some pushback on the market's conclusion that now maybe we can see the Fed's ultimate destination on rates. But I do think because sentiment still has this reservoir of doubt that can be burned off uh, in the form of people raising equity exposures. Yeah, I, I, I think there's an opportunity for that. And then if that doesn't happen, it does sort of tell you something where you do uh, have this sense out there that people are just not going to buy it. and They're going to have to wait and see for more confirmation on the macro number. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'll see you in a few hours. Look forward yep. to that. That's uh, your last word in overtime, of course. Up next, double digit gains for one of Josh Brown's stock picks, plus the stock he just sold. Talk about it next. Josh, let's talk about the sell of Meta. Um, when and why? 
Uh, I sold it a couple of days ago, before before today, obviously, before today's pop. Uh, I just have better things to do with it. A lot of my favorite names had come down, and, you know, I, I think I bought it a little bit early. I bought it on the day it collapsed uh, at about 99. I probably should have waited a couple of days. I normally do. I would have gotten it, you know, maybe low 90s. Um, but I, it was a small trade, didn't really mean that much, and I decided to uh, reallocate elsewhere. Uh, Dutch Bros. <laughs> Is having a great day today, and uh, one of yeah. yours been talking about that for an awfully long time. Yeah, let's keep in mind I'm still down in this stock from where, where I originally bought it. I'm still down somewhere in the in the mid teens percentage wise. But this is like a classic example of just a company that came public at the wrong time. And if this were a normal market environment, uh, I think the stock would be much higher because they are absolutely crushing it. Uh, they guided higher on revenue. How many companies can you think of that are doing that? Um, they had uh, 30, I think 38 new stores open in the third quarter, five consecutive quarters now of opening at least 30 locations. And when I say stores, you can't walk in. It's all drive through. That's the whole thing. Um, but they're on fire. So they, they reported uh, almost 200 million in sales this quarter. That's 53 percent ahead of the same quarter last year. Also put through a price increase. Absolutely no problem. No slowdown whatsoever. And they're going to finish the year, I think, with 800 stores, and they're talking about going up to 4,000 stores over the next few years. All they can do is execute. They, like, this, is, this is a company that's been around for decades, by the way. All they can do is do what they've always done, keep opening stores, keep making the consumer happy, keep delivering. They can't control that growth stocks are out of favor or the Fed is doing whatever it's doing. Like, so I think if you're really an investor— which is what I'm trying to do with, with this particular company, uh -huh. you just have to accept the fact that you could be right on the fundamentals and the stock price not reward you for that right away. So that's the focus here. I'm staying with it. And, uh, again, I'm, I'm hoping to be in it for the long term, not for a trade. All right. We'll do, uh, speaking of trades, we'll do final trades next. we got a big guest coming up in overtime today. That gentleman right there, Carl Icahn, the Icahn Enterprises chairman, all things markets.
We'll find out his current positioning, too. Obvious reaction to the CPI, what he thinks the Fed should do uh, coming up. Talk about his Twitter play, too, ahead of the Musk deal, what he said he was going to do if Musk didn't come in and buy that company. That was very interesting. We'll get into more detail there. So I hope you'll all join me there. Dan Greenhouse, Victoria Green, Kevin Simpson coming up as well. Uh, that's in three hours' time. I should remind you, too, tomorrow, uh, Veterans Day, we've got Anthony Noto of SoFi joining us once again, which we're excited about, the veteran, uh, of course. And uh, we'll talk to him tomorrow about the markets, too, payment space and uh, everything that needs to be discussed with him. I look forward to that. Brenda Vangelo, Final Trade, why don't you start us off? And with Adobe. So this is a tech name that's really down and out. Valuations very depressed versus where it trades at historically. Just made a controversial acquisition, but this management team has an excellent track record of making value-add acquisitions that really add to total addressable market. So All like right. Thank you. Rob Seachin. Home Depot, we own it. I buy it in the next week's earnings. Great breakout today on an absolute and relative basis. It's the best in class franchise, reasonable valuation. Housing market is a challenge, but they're a best in class management team. Okay, Jason so, Snipe. Jason Snipe, quick. I like TJX here, super lean cost crusher, cost structure, and okay. they'll have the ability to solidify the, those bargains. Just a yeah. name, Josh. I got to go. NEE, Next Hour Energy. All right. Thanks, guys. See you in overtime. The exchange is now. Hello, everybody. I am Brian Sullivan. And once again, for Kelly Evans, here is what is ahead. Inflation is cooling and stocks are heating up. A key piece of data suggesting the Fed may start to back off the Fed rate hike gas pedal. We'll take a look at where we can go from here and how to position now. Plus, crypto chaos. FTX reportedly on the brink. And its founder facing all kinds of questions. It is hitting the entire crypto world. But is the worst now behind us or maybe still to come? And just how much are rising rates hitting housing? We are going to look west with the CEO of one of Seattle's biggest banks, who's actually live right here in studio. All that and much more ahead. But we begin where else? With this big inflation-fueled rally. But it's an inflation-fueled rally that's kind of a good inflation-fueled rally because inflation actually cooled down just a bit. Still red hot historically, but the trend is what the market looked for. And this is turning out to be a massive day for the bulls, particularly on the tech side. And by the way, a reminder of why it's so key to not try to time the market, right? You want to be in the market every day because you're going to have days like this that kind of come out of nowhere. Anyway, the S&P and the NASDAQ are on pace for their best day in two years. The NASDAQ is up 5.5%. In fact, numerically, the NASDAQ not up as much as the Dow, but it's not far off. The NASDAQ's up 576 points every se on a market like this. Obviously, every sector is trading higher, led by consumer discretionary, real estate, tech, whatever you name it, it's up. Speaking of tech, big caps really taken off. You know the names. Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft. Look at this. Amazon is up almost 11%. Microsoft up 6%, Alphabet and Apple up 6 and 6.5%, 6 some of the biggest gains in years. Semiconductor stocks also being bid up, AMD, NVIDIA, Western Digital, all with 9 plus percent gain, actually 10, 12% for AMD. I mean, is this sustainable? Well, we don't know. That's going to be the question. There's probably a little computer action thrown into this as well, unless investors just see their business 12% better because of a slightly lower inflation reading. I'll let you be the judge on that. On the flip side of equities, yields, they're going down. At one point, the 10-year yield was down 30 basis points. We're back under 4%, to 3.84%. There's this inflation print right here. Whee! It's like that guy from The Price is Right, if you went over, the Alpine guy. And then, you know, anyway. Crypto is actually following all this bullishness despite the FTX drama. Bitcoin, it is back above 17,000. It's up 4, call it 5%, 792 to 17, 281. Completing the hat trick or the quad trick, quadrophenia, whatever. Commodities are also moving higher. Oil, natural gas, gold, palladium. Basically, it is the everything rally redux. There we go. All right, let's talk about it all now. Joining us to kick off the hour is Brian Railing. He is global head of fixed income strategy at Wells Fargo Investment Institute. And Keith Fitzgerald, principal at the Fitzgerald Group. Keith, I will start with you. I'm not being cynical about the rally. It is a good day in what has been a tough year, but I just wonder if stocks deserve to have, deserving got nothing to do with it, if stocks should be moving up this much on a slightly lower inflation number. 
Well, should be in RR2, obviously very different questions. You know, this is something that's very interesting to investors because there will be no warning bell when the Fed lets off or inflation begins to moderate. So what you're seeing today is par for the course. People want in, they want good news to actually be good. So I love what I'm seeing. Whether it sticks or not is a different question. Brian, what do you think? Will this stick? Has inflation peaked? Will the Fed turn dovish? I mean, I don't think the Fed's turning dovish. I think inflation has peaked. Uh, but, um, you know, this is going to be uh, an up and down process. But, you know, I think we're in the process of finding the peak in yields. So, um, you know, I think overall, yeah, good news. But no, this isn't just smooth sailing. Yeah, I, I should probably get the word dovish out of our lexicon because it's like a, there's a big difference between a hawk and a dove. There's falcons. There's owls. You know, other birds of prey. I mean, the Fed is still going to raise rates in December. Are they not, Keith? Well, I think so. I mean, look at it this way. The Fed got transitory wrong. The Fed has gotten this wrong. So why on earth are we even looking to what the Fed's going to do? They have a history of overshooting. So I think that's a foregone conclusion. Personally, what I'd like to do, especially on days like today, is pick those strong names, look for the CEOs that are putting numbers up on the table and who are already ahead of where this is going. Guys, sit tight. We're going to come right back to you. We're not letting you go, but we do have an auction on 30-year bonds. Pretty good indicator of demand and where people think inflation may be going. Rick Santelli, how did that 30-year bond auction go? How do you grade it, Professor? Exactly the opposite of yesterday, Sully. Yesterday was a D minus. Today is a solid A. Boy, this is what an auction should look like. And I'll tell you what, when you see yields drop as much as they have prior to the auction, I have to tell you I was a bit surprised at the aggressiveness of investors. So let's go through it. 21 billion 30 years. The yield... 4.08, the when issued market yield was hovering at 4.11. So turn the screws three basis points, the exact opposite of tailing, and that's a good thing. And if you look at all the metrics, they were very good. The one that really stuck out, though, was the dealer takedown. Sully, the 10 auction average is 13%. I have 20 years of history here, and I cannot find a better, a smaller takedown by the dealer community. So a solid A, and it really goes a long way in telling us not only do equity investors and foreign exchange investors pay close attention to this morning's numbers, but the aggressive tendencies this auction shows that many investors think that the trend of less inflation most likely will continue. Back to you. Rick, thank you. Not sure I can remember the last time Rick gave anything an A. I mean, who, who knows? Uh, Brian, forget about inflation. Do you think that Yields on the 30 and the 10 year have peaked? I think there's a decent chance they peaked. I think it's a good point to accumulate, maybe not on a day like today uh, where yields have crashed lower, but you know, I think we'll be back up around the fours. Um, and I'd be locking in rates for the long term. I mean, if the Fed gets inflation down, uh, you know, to two and a half or below, you know, a four percent. Uh, locked in rate is going to look really good. I mean, the best trade back in uh, the early 80s was buying long bonds. I mean, we've come down half a percentage point on the 10-year in a matter of weeks. We, we peaked out at 4.32%. We're at 3.83%. And, you know, Keith, is one of the reasons that we, I mean, listen, we get so obsessive, right, about these little nuanced numbers. But why stock investors care, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that interest rates impact how you discount free cash flow, and they impact valuations. So these moves, like 12% jumps in, at you know, AMD, it's a slight valuation shift, I have to imagine. You are absolutely right. And so I would take that one step further because when the cost of capital comes down, it also means that the big money, the computer money, the large hedge funds of the world can get on the gas because they can borrow more and use more leverage. The place that they go right for the jugular vein is going to be the big liquid stuff, the names that everybody's got to have in their portfolios come bonus time at the end of the year. So that's the kind of stuff that on a day like today is really important to watch because it tells you who's got an appetite. And to Rick's point, a lot of people do. Right yeah, now. and Keith, one more. Do you, do you think this is humans doing this? I mean, this 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 smells like a lot of Wall Street computers. Not taking anything away from how good it feels. 
Well, I tell you, I've been doing this 42 years at mm. this point, was there for the early days of computers. They're definitely at hand, they're definitely playing. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But also, there's a lot of individual investors who are waking up and going, you know, I should be in the game. That's the biggest fear is they're not yeah. right now. So you're gonna see some FOMO fuel in this too. And uh, Brian, what's the next most important thing you're looking for now that the CPI is out of the way? I mean, I think we got a little bit of a runway here. I think the next most important thing is that Fed meeting uh, in uh, December. You're going to get the CPI right during that meeting, and then we're going to get a summary of economic projections. So we're going to get a lot more information uh, coming uh, out of that meeting. Yeah, and that meeting is on December 13th and 14th. Brian and Keith, great stuff. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, we are just getting started here on The Exchange, and coming up, we're going to speak with the co-founder of Tether about all the drama in the crypto world. Plus, how much are higher rates really hitting housing? CEO of one of Seattle's leading banks is here. As we had to break, here's another look at markets with stocks in rally mode. After that inflation data, the NASDAQ is up 600 points, nearly 6%. Take the family to dinner tonight, for Pete's sakes. We're back right after this. This is The Exchange on CNBC. Right, welcome back to The Exchange. Skip more now on the constantly developing and very important story around the collapse of crypto exchange FTX and its hedge fund Alameda Research. The CEO out this morning with a long and often rather bizarre tweet thread this morning saying a lot of stuff, and including, quote, I blanked up. Now, multiple reports are saying FTX used customer funds to make risky investment bets. Let's take a look at what FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried actually said on the record to Congress just a few months ago. Listen. If you look at what precipitated some of the 2008 financial crisis, you saw a number of bilateral, bespoke, non-reported, 
uh, transactions happening between financial counterparties, which then got repackaged and re-leveraged again and again and again, such that no one knew how much risk was in that system until it all fell apart. If you compare that to what happens on FTX or other major cryptocurrency venues today, there is complete transparency about the full open interest. There is complete transparency about the positions that are held. There is a robust, robust, consistent risk framework applied, and we're excited to work with the CFTC on our uh, U.S. license and regulated venue um, to bring a lot of this uh, to U.S. customers as well. That was in late 2021, and then a few months later, maybe a year later, they announced that a former CFTC commissioner was going to join their board. Reeve Collins is co-founder of Tether, and he joins us now. There's still a lot we don't know. Uh, Bankman Freed speaking to Congress right there, saying transparency, transparency, transparency. Take from it what you will. What is your take right now on the FTX situation and Sam Bankman Freed personally? Well, on the situation overall, it really is a crippling blow to the crypto industry. It, it, at, at of all times for it to take place, especially during the midterms when crypto regulation is kind of top of mind already, and where Sam Bankman Friedman teed himself up to be the go-to advisor for a lot of the regulators and kind of the champion of regulation in the space, for him to implode like this, it, it's really a devastating blow. And as you can see from the markets, it's having a great impact. Yeah, and it's and it's reducing confidence. I think this is a fair statement, reducing confidence across the entire ecosystem, including Tether, the stable coin that you co-founded. What's your response to what would you say to Sam Bankman Fried if you were in the same room with him right now? Well, I think everyone wants to know how he could possibly let it get this far out of hand. Some of the th but but I want everyone to know and realize it's still a lot of speculation. We're getting all of this news in real time, and most of these of this news is coming from rumors. We don't really know the true story, and everyone loves to speculate. It becomes much more sens sensationalized that way. And so we still need a few more days for this to play out to really understand what happened. It doesn't mean that he didn't make some really big missteps, and I'm very interested to see what specifically those were and if they are as bad as everyone is speculating them to be. It still is unbelievable that he could put himself in this position. Um, and I am going to ask you to speculate a little bit, Reeve, and, and if you don't know, you don't know, and just say that, because the question I've got, and I was just on the phone with, with our reporter, Kate Rooney, right before the show, and I said, okay, they're claiming $8 billion in losses, or at least that's the report. So my question to Kate and, and to you is very simple. What are these $8 billion in losses? This is an exchange. I mean, if Uber loses a $1 billion a quarter, I get it, because they have operating expenses that are outstripping their revenue. That happens a lot. This is an exchange it's supposed to be asset light. Do you have any idea what these eight billion dollars of losses actually represent? Again, there's a lot of speculation, and some of that speculation is that he did use customer funds to bail out Almeida, his essentially hedge fund venture arm. And this is a knockdown effect from the Terra Luna collapse. Brian, I think you did a segment on that earlier. And it had massive um, ripple effect in the industry. And he bailed out Alameda, who was heavily involved in that, uh, in Terra Luna as well. And it seems like this could potentially be that he over leveraged himself because they stepped up. They tried to saw, um, save a lot of companies that were impacted by the Terra Luna collapse. And it seems like he just got a little over leveraged and did some things he probably shouldn't have done. I mean, and if and if that is right, again, this is I want to be clear. We don't know. This is a lot of speculation. We've got a lot of data that everybody's trying to piece together. The DOJ is according to Kate Rooney is going to get involved. If it turns out that there was just good old fashioned losses at Alameda, right, that this guy with an MIT physics degree, maybe and his team just weren't good at investing. We've seen it before. Long term capital management, among others, that if there were just losses that were then backed up by FTT or FTX or Bankman Freed or customer accounts, whatever it might be, in some weird way, would that be a relief to the industry? Because it, it doesn't necessarily mean there is an industry wide contagion that this is just, wow, they really blanked up in Bankman Freed's own words. Exactly. And one of the biggest issues is Almeida's balance sheet did hold a lot of FTT token as well as Solana token. And when those imploded and the prices went down, then that was what they were utilizing as collateral. 
And so they weren't able to, to, to make good on any of the positions that they had in the market. And so that's why he was trying to bail them out. And so, yeah, it, yeah it's really created a lot well, of it issues. It sounds like, and, I, and I got to go to a movie for this. I'm going to quote the great poet philosopher Tony Montana, who in Scarface said, don't get high on your own supply. Right. And, 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 if, and if you've got a company that is basically backing up its own assets with its own assets, um, do you wonder, Reeve, listen, you founded, co-founded Tether, you've, you've worked at Razorfish, you've started companies, probably very well regulated, heavily regulated companies. Do you wonder how the how regulators just miss this? Just well, it's not that they missed it. It's very difficult to regulate. And the regulators are doing their best to educate themselves and ideally make responsible regulations. And, S and Sam Bankman Friedman was putting himself first and foremost in that space to actually help them regulate and to become the most regulated exchange. So it is devastating that this took place. Um, I do know that it is going to trigger a lot more scrutiny, a lot more regulation. But there are companies like Coinbase and Circle based in the U.S. that are